to the Batmobile. Let's go. Ready to move out. Okay, so let's get going. Welcome to today's masterclass. is part of our sprint for 2018. So the goal here is to take a snapshot of different areas within your organization to say, what could we improve going forward to the end of the year? And the idea, if you put a little bit of effort now into your business, you're not going to arrive back in the new year and to have to start off from a weak point. So we want to start off strong in the new year. So I've taken different areas of an organization that we work with it and saying, how do we add different ideas, uh, various um, uh, concepts, and then break them up into different things? And what is, a, what is an impact that we can have in a business? Product diversification, it's the, it's the act of becoming or making more from what you have. And that is the key thing there is that finding out what you've got and then working out how you can do that. So what can we, what, what do we have in our, in our assets? What do we have in our control? What do we have in our armory that if you were a little bit creative, you could then add more to this. And I think that's the key thing that, that, that we want to look at. So I work on this expansion consolidation model with our clients. And ultimately what we're saying is that let's, well, let's expand, let's do new things and expand your business, throw out a whole lot of ideas, get really, really creative, grow your business as much as, much as you can, and then stop and evaluate. How do we then evaluate? Well, you can't manage anything you can't measure. So have measurement capabilities. And we're not saying go implement huge M&E systems in there, but just be able to manage it. You're trying a new marketing method like an advert in a newspaper, make sure you can measure it by asking people, where did you hear, hear about us? And how do we do that? So simple measurement process. And then once we expand, you're able to then consolidate and consolidation means we're going to go kill the stuff that sucks in the business and this is something that you cannot be emotionally attached to something in your organization we i just find people get so emotionally attached to their products and services because i know we put all our effort into it and we put all our all our focus into creating something that we might not then be um, ready to let go of it. So the key thing there is let go of your of your ideas and then be able to then reevaluate them or cut them off completely. So the key here is learning how to fail fast and fail cheaply, and that is key process to growing a business. As soon as you get emotionally attached to something, you hold on to it and you hold on to it and you hold on to it and you hold on to it. So I was listening to a talk um, by a friend of mine, Fred Rude. Um, he's just put out a book and it's, it's a really interesting thing and that he was says when he started his first business, it was a brilliant business idea and it was really good and they were helping people and the world was a better place, but it started to fail because it wasn't financially sustainable and he held on to it and held on to it and held on to it and when eventually the sheriff came knocking on his door, he was a million and a half rand in debt and the key thing is don't hold on to your businesses long. And you're asking like, Fred, what lessons have you learned? And he says, you know what I've learned? Learn how to fail fast. So assess something and if it's not working, either iterate it or kill it and to be able to do that. So iteration and rehashing is something that I do a lot with our own businesses and we do a lot with the clients that we work with and taking what they've got, rehash it, try it out, get there, rehash it, try it out. So that expansion consolidation, expansion consolidation, expansion consolidation is a methodology we should be using 
for our lives in so many ways other than just business. It's a matter of growing a business and trying different things. Never wait until it's perfect before you go to market. And there's a little saying that says, if you're not ashamed of your product when you go to market, you've waited too long. And that's an interesting one because so much of ours, you know, we, we all semi-perfectionists, um, maybe a little bit, you know, um, anal and that has got to be 100% right. It doesn't have to be right to go to market because you want to go to market with something and then get that feedback from people so you then you can improve it and change it because waiting till it's perfect means that there's a good chance of failure because you think it's perfect and you're going to hold on to it. Kind of makes, makes sense. So let's look at what product diversification is. What is your, <clears throat> what are your assets? If you're going to diversify your assets to create other income streams, what are those assets? And that's an interesting question because a lot of people don't know what they have. So I've made a list here and we'll kind of go through them and we'll say, okay, so the first asset that we have are our products and services. So if you make a list down on a sheet and saying, these are all my products, these are all my services, what am I, what have I got to offer other people? What have I got now to give to other people with the products and services? And then you start looking at them is that what other forms of income can I get from those? And that's, that's the question. That's the underlying question that we're going to ask for every single category of this. How else can I earn an alternate income stream from what I have. So I've got my products, I've got my services. So for instance, I've got a workshop that I run, okay? It's called How to Tell a Story for a Business Plan. And we've got that. So we create and I write the story, I write the, the workshop and I've got a workbook and I've got PowerPoint slides and all that. And I go and advertise and people come and they come and do the two day, three day workshop and they go away and I get paid and it's great. The question is, how else can I leverage that to get other forms of income? And a lot of people just get, well, that's what we've got there. But let's be creative. Let's take that workshop and say, well, hang on, we can actually write a book. So we put the whole workshop into a book. We create a book and we put that book on Amazon as an ebook and we sell it through Loot in South Africa and we put it on eBay and we phone Alibaba and we put it on there. And now we've created that workshop as a book or an ebook and we're selling it across the entire world. And people go pay 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever, 200 rand, depends on what you've got there. And people then get there. And that's nice because for zero effort going forward, you've got a passive income stream. I can also take that workshop and then I can convert that workshop into a video course. So I've created that same workshop, but then I just break it down into videos. I go film the videos and you can use Zoom like this to film your videos. You record them, you edit them, you create your course and you've got your slides and your products and you create different modules and you upload that course to a number of platforms. And there's, uh, there's about 15 active platforms that are available for online training training courses. Once you create the course once, uploading it takes a couple of hours to upload it. You create a profile and you add your bank account and then every month they send you money for zero effort. Product diversification is a real simple sort of thing. Once you think outside the box and almost every product that's not a consumable product because you can't necessarily resell bread and milk, but looking at the services environment and the product environment, how else can you get products? Alternate services for that. <clears throat> you can also look at upselling. So if I sell you a motor car, I can then get product diversification out of that by upselling you a service plan or a car wash or an oil change or insurance for your tires. And we kind of get used to that because a lot of people are doing that.
When you walk into a restaurant and order a burger, they saying, well, how do I upsell that? You know, do you want a soda with that? Do you want chips with that? Do you want an ice cream? You know, are you going to sit down and eat here because then this and this. And so we get used to being diversified into more and more extended products that we have. So think about your products and maybe for the new year, you can say, well, we're going to launch our new online service or we're going to put our workbook into an ebook and sell it online. And it's amazing how easy it is to become an author these days because most of us have some form of product that's just a matter of getting it edited and putting it up um, online and having people then join us for that. So it's quite easy and quite simple to um, to to organize. I, okay, I say that with a pinch of salt. It's not always that easy, but with the right type of people around you, and I've just found a gem of a person yesterday. I found an editor. So we now have in our in our cluster of competence, as we call it, which is our kind of inner circle of referrer, we've got the most dynamic editor who's now going to be helping us. And she's editing one of our courses, which we're writing at the moment, which is about a hundred page workbook. And she's on that for this, this week. And she's helping us edit that and getting up to the level of standard that we need. And then that's going to be online from next year as a university course offered around Southern Africa, where hundreds of people are going to be doing that and each time someone does that they send me a chunk of change into the bank account for zero effort once it's done um, and the nice thing about that these guys are even paying me to create the course which is just uh yeah really really nice but what about the other stuff that you own where we only speak about products and services and we think about that but what about your equipment what about your tools that you have if you've got or data projector, if you've got a laptop, if you've got, um, you know, a, a laminator um, and all these other things. We have so many products and so many different sets of equipment that we have lying around that we don't always think about what we could use them for to get alternate income streams. And I just want to plant that seed in your head. Go around and look at the stuff that you've sitting there. What else could you use your laptop for? And not necessarily your time, but your laptop. What could you use a data projector for? What could you use your set of chairs for? What could you do, you know, set that? And that leads to the, the whole office environment. Now, you know, we've got a training room that we have in the office. I've got a film studio in the office here. And we've looked at that and said, well, what can we use the training room for when I'm not using it? Well, we rent it out for other people. We have all sorts of weird people, um, uh, wonderful people coming here and using our training room. And what it is, it's great because it puts feet through our doors, which is good brand exposure. And we offer a great experience for a training room or boardroom meeting. And we can use that. So this afternoon, we've got a board meeting from an outside company coming in to use the boardroom for a meeting and we provide teas and coffees and cookies and they use that thing so in the evenings the people come and use the uh, the offices and the weekends people come and rent the offices and the film studio is available and we're able to re-rent the equipment that we have and the assets that we have to create alternate forms of income none of these is part of what we advertise on the website. We don't offer ourselves, oh, we're a rental organization or we have video services. None of that's on the website, but it's what we have and we've just diversified that to create all sorts of income. We even have spare parking in the office that we re-rent. And that's a nice sort of stuff there. We, we've got a spare office that's up for rent at the moment. And we're looking for a permanent person for an office in Cape Town. They can come get an office, free Wi-Fi, free tea and coffee and a parking space. And you can sit there and share our offices with us and get part of that. So those are all the different things that we're looking at. It's just a matter of looking at it differently and moving out. So what about your intellectual property. Now, yeah, we look at intellectual property and we immediately think, oh, I don't have a patent and I don't have any of this and, you know, it's too expensive and stuff. But intellectual property is more than just 
patents, it's wisdom, it's your experience, it's your recipes, it's your formulas, it's your drawing, it's your creativity, and it's what you've got there, using your intellectual property for diversification. So how does that work? Well, you can license what you've got to other people, I can take that workshop and saying, well, these workshops are my ideas. This is my model that we own as a business. And I can license somebody else to run one of my workshops. And we've done that. And we've got a number of people um, running our workshop. And each time they run it, they pay a license fee back to us. Or they buy the course outright for a higher price. And then they run it at their own um, course. So we got a we got a financial game that we that we created. It's called um, Workflow 101, and it, it looks at um, how to build a business and order stock and manage loans and product manufacture and retail and selling and and there's a financial aspect where you got to reconcile. And it's a beautiful board game, and it's a huge amount of fun to to play and we play it for our own customers but we sell the game as well and then we allow other people to use the game to run their games and they pay us a license fee every time they run it so it's looking at use of intellectual property and to be able to get get that also I'm amazed at how many vehicles sit in the office parking lot all day just saying could you be using your office vehicle for alternate sources of income while it's just sitting outside in the parking lot or outside your warehouse or all that? And it's interesting that you just got to ask these questions. And I'm sure most of you say, no one's going to touch my car. There's no way. There. But that's fine then. But if you've got a bucky or a, or a flatbed or something like that, you could well use that for alternate sources of income. I saw a lovely email the other day on Facebook. The guy says, I'm sending my truck up to Joburg to send some stuff, but it's coming back empty. Does anybody want to hire a portion of it to load stuff on it? That's brilliant thinking. It's true entrepreneurial thinking. They could cover their fuel cost and more by just loading other things on there. I've got a chair, I've got a box, I've got this, load a whole lot of stuff too um, small for large consignments and that. And that could well end up being a business because that's how career services kind of offer. So it's asking those questions and and being able to push that. So that's all your assets that you own. Those are all the stuff that you kind of tangible items. What about your non-tangible things? Well, mm, now we start pushing this. What about staff? Okay, now those of you who have staff, how do you diversify your staff? And it's not that we're going to go put them up for rent on Facebook, okay? Um, and it's not there. So I know Amanda's a listing. We're not going to put you up for sale, okay, Amanda? Um, but the key thing there is what does your skills, what skills do your staff have that you could use for alternate sources of income? Instead of a staff being a cost center, how do you turn them into a profit center by utilizing their skills in other ways? And that's a, you know, we always employ staff. We um, interview them and we employ them and we have job descriptions and our, you know, KPAs and KPIs and we kind of put them in a box and things. And then once we know what they can do, we got to ask the question, well, how do we upskill? How do we diversify? How do we get more out of our staff? So there's a term that we use about sweating your equity, sweat the assets. And it's exactly the same way with staff. If you've got staff that are non-productive, that are sitting back and only working when something happens, how do you make them proactive and get them to make things happen for them? It's like all the people, hundreds and thousands of people sitting in shops as shop consultants waiting for a customer to walk into the store, only to look up from the counter at the back and say, can I help you? And then you say, no, just looking, and then you can move on. Well, why are they even in the, in the store? Why are they even employed? Why don't you just get a robot to say that? Um, if your staff are not working for your business, then they're just becoming a cost to your business. So you've got to utilize that. How do we then leverage 
those people around with that. So we've got staff. We've also got our reputation and, and our experience. And a lot of what we do there is we look at what is your personal brand? What is your personal reputation in the market? And is that worth anything? And that's an interesting stuff. So, you know, as you know, I've branded myself Batman for business and we work very hard and I've got a new offering called the seven laws of the bat cave which we're launching later this week and really excited about that and people come listen to it because of the reputation of Batman and we leveraging off a superhero and to be able to do that and people enjoy that because it's something they relate to and it's not just oh it's not just another business coach it's something interesting and we played with the bat cave so my office now is the bat cave and we can do that so the blue background you see behind me is normally the bat cave background which is far more exciting and playing around with the different reputation that i have in the marketplace and my experience that we that that i've gained over the whole years of both me and the company and the partners and the staff to be able to leverage into the marketplace. So get yourself um, out there to create a reputation. Well, how do you do that? Well, you go out and you speak at events, you go write for blogs, you go write for other people, um, you comment on blogs, and you then start your LinkedIn profile, create a professional conversation, create your own blog, and you start building that reputation where you become an authority on a subject, and then you can leverage off that. So you've got to become an asset to yourself with that and we speak about these things called OPT and OPM wonderful acronyms there and what are they doing there well it's called other people's time and other people's money and that's the basis for diversification because if you can create money for you utilizing other people's time and other people's money you've got the perfect business model so if you've got people that are subscribing, like my online courses that we have. So we have a whole bunch of courses. There's about 15 of our courses on six different platforms and taken by people all around the world. Now, the people who manage the courses, they putting their effort into it. They gain in marketing for it. Then other people are going there and spending money on that. And I just get money every month paid to us for doing absolutely zero work other than leveraging other people's time to be able to do that. And it's a great model to have and it's a great model to build and to grow within your organization. So the best, one of the best models that you can have is monthly subscriptions. And that's a model that's sought after. It's the most prized possession that a lot of companies look after. Um, Mnet have got it well, um, Discovery Health have got it well, and those are the two companies that really modeled subscription marketing to its maximum. Mnet are not doing that well anymore, but they've peaked, but they having huge opposition at the moment now with with Netflix and the online streaming and they're using they're losing tens of thousands of clients on a weekly basis apparently because of that but they've got to jack themselves up, but their model still stands. It's a subscription model, and what they're losing out to is other subscription models that are just offering more for less, but people are going from one subscription model to the other. Gym membership is exactly the same sort of model, and people buy two-year subscriptions, um, cell phone models and stuff, so it's really because you've got predictable income, and predictable income through sus subscription models and retain a pay payments is absolute key for your organization and that's using other people's time and other people's money often because then you have to do very little other than service the same thing over and over again so if we record this webinar and we put it up and we sell it it's doing exactly what we have people will watch this over and over again and I have zero effort once it's done and edited and put up but then people can pay for it to hear the wisdom and access the product. So it's an interesting thing there. So what about your website? What about your social media? Is that worth anything? Is it worth, you know, people 
paying to write on your blog? Um, is it worth other people wanting to repost your stuff on other blogs and pay you for that? Can you leverage that? There's a job called Influencer, which is a new job on the, on the, on the block this year. Um, and if you're deemed an influencer, which means you've got so many followers on your Instagram account or so many views on your YouTube account, you can become an influencer and you get paid by companies to talk about things. In the movies, they call it product placement. Social media, they say an influencer. So I can go to an influencer and say, won't you mention my product? And I pay them 10,000 Rand and in one of their blog posts, they mention, oh, Bruce Wade, Batman, this course and this course. And out of that, I get 20, 30, 40,000 Rand's worth of, of income from that. It's a good money to do that. And so people are paying influencers to be able to do that. Obviously, the greatest influencer that we know is um, Oprah and Oprah Winfrey, whatever she says, people buy. And she's the greatest influencer that we have and a great model that a lot of people have done there. But South Africa influencers are up and coming and we see more and more of them and people are following them and creating great things. So um, Africa fashion, Africa music, Africa food and all that. There's a whole bunch of people that are earning good money just by having a following on Instagram and leveraging that with other people's time and other people's money. So just to finish off here, we've got five points, five ideas to add to your business to help expand to create further income for that. And let's see if we can get, get through them here. So the first one is license your products for other people to use. And that's it. Just create a license. It doesn't have to even have a lawyer. You just create a service level agreement. You license and say, this is what I do. Get other people to utilize it. They pay you a license fee and passive income, other people's time, other people's money. You can take your ideas and put them online and you can get that. Um, and I just got a gift from Zoom. They've removed our 40 minute limit on that. Isn't that nice? Thank you, Zoom. Um, and unpacking that. So looking at putting your products online, and we've spoken about that, creating your products. You can either sell your products online or put them online for other people to sell as online retention, eBooks, courses, notes. We've got a whole lot of cheat sheets. What we did, we just took, uh, there's about nine, eight or nine cheat sheets, like one or two pages. We created a PDF, we put them in there, people buy them for 150 Rand and we sell lots of them and it's brilliant. I, you know, we really have to do nothing other than count the money at the end of the month with that. Okay, you can lease out your equipment, your tools and your spaces when it's not used and think about that. Obviously, you don't wanna lease out things and give things away that are gonna come back broken. So be careful of that. But um, if you've got stuff that's not being used, well, lease it out, rent out your video projector, rent out your laptops, rent out desk space, rent out your know, corner of an office, rent out your coffee machine to the guys next door. See what else you can do to do that. You can upskill your staff, put your staff on courses, upskill them because the more skilled they're going to be, the more you can get out of them and you can sweat that equity as well. And then you can collaborate with teams. And this is a real interesting one because it's a model that we use. We've got a very small company and a very small team and we punch way above our weight as, a, as an organization. And we're able to put in um, tenders. We've just got a tender at the moment in for about 17 million rand. Now there's no ways our company is at all capable of fulfilling that. But what we've done, we've created a consortium of about six companies and we've all thrown our weight in there. And none of the six companies is able to do this, but together we're a force to be reckoned with. And that's what we're able to do. So learn how to collaborate, learn how to cooperate. Again there, OPT, OPM, and to be able to collaboration is that perfect example. Go after the bigger contracts, go after the larger work by creating that team that you can do with that. Okay, here's some ideas now, five ideas to save in your business, all right? 
why have an office? And this is a question I'm asking myself more than once at recently. Why do we have an office? Well, it's great to have an office and utilize, but if we're not utilizing the office at 100%, well, why don't you have a home office or why don't you have a shared office space? There are so many of these shared office spaces and hot desks. You can go work and sit at a coffee shop all day for the price of a coffee and get free Wi-Fi. And it's an interesting place. More and more people are working out, more and more people are working. At Cape Town, we've got this thing called Workshop 17 at the waterfront. And there are hundreds of people there every day, working, collaborating, renting a, a desk, sitting outside. You got coffee, you got bathrooms, you got meeting rooms, you got Wi-Fi. What more do you need than signing a three-year lease agreement worth millions and having to have that monthly uh, rental fee? With that, you still get to meet other people. I know working from home can be very lonely and very frustrating. Um, I did it for about five years, and there were times that I just needed to get out and go meet other people. Um, but it's nice in those shared workspaces. It reduces your... Um, your overheads and creates an environment where you can then play around and um, work with others. So you can outsource your non-essential staff functions to freelancers, and that's exactly what we've done with this freelancer that we've got. I don't have to employ a freelancer. I don't have to employ a copywriter. Um, we can then outsource all the editing of this document. We outsource all our graphic design. We outsource all our web development. We outsource our printing. We've got very minimal um, laser printers in the office. Uh, we outsource all the color printing that we need and all the laminating and all that sort of stuff we can outsource because it limits our overheads. And that's the opposite of diversification. We're now doing consolidation. And you can see we're not only expanding, but we're also cutting off where you're not thinking. And I would love a beautiful color printer. And I would love all the, all the um, laminate and binders and all that sort of stuff in the office, but it's cheaper to actually outsource those things with that. And all that goes together, leasing the tools that you need. You know, so many people lease their laptops and they lease their cell phones and stuff. And as you grow there, don't go and own it. You can lease um, chairs and tables and you can bring in catering and you can do all that when and as needed if it's not a regular thing that you can do. And we've got this weird sort of thing that we think we need to own everything, but the idea of creating that diversification and outsourcing things creates then not only wealth for other people, but a cost saving for ourselves. So it's that whole thing about Ubering. And now, you know, more and more people that I know are now selling their cars and giving up their cars for the use of Uber and my city buses in Cape Town and using public transport. Now, I know if you might live in Joburg and different places, it's going to be a problem. Um, if you're living in the outlying areas, then cars are essential. But if you're living in the inner city, working in the inner city, then and there's no reason to own a car. There's no reason to have the overhead of that. I ride a scooter. I gave up my car. Um, and I use my car probably two days every two weeks. Um, and most of the time I'm riding my scooter. And I zip in and on the traffic. And I save money. I save on parking. I save on fuel. I save on time. I'm cutting, adding extra five hours a week to my life purely by giving up my car and to be able to ride a scooter, get there and, and back faster. Don't have to pay for parking. I can go park on the pavement wherever I want. And the fuel is, I don't know, a tenth of what I would use in my car. So it's a huge saving. So Ubering out um, a lot of those sort of things there. And the last one we've already spoken about, best way to save is co-opt people into collaboration teams for different projects. And I think that's the absolute thing. And we're doing that all the time. We've got three different projects happening at the moment where we're collaborating with other people and we're working with, with people, creating those teams as and when needed and then dissolving those teams later. Clear service level agreements, SLA agreements, hold everything together, understanding of where it is. But once you learn to work with people once or twice, it becomes really good. And that level of trust grows and grows and grows. And you're able to end up being a really successful um, team and in a successful organization with that. So the message today is 
sweat your equity and save where you can. Diversification, how do you take what you've got and diversify that into a multitude of different um, income streams, but then cutting back the ones that don't work, cutting back on the ones that are costing you money or not making you money and make your business more profitable and a bit more focused for 2018. So when you come back in 2019, it's that little bit stronger and you're starting the year off on a sprint, not a lump with that.